When I was growing up in Palo Alto, in fact, I too was thrilled with this nuclear technology that was going to change the world. I was so happy one day when I got the blueprint, for example, of the atomic car. The atomic car, that's right, you would ride on 60 tons of lead down Main Street in your, in your hometown on 60 tons of lead with a nuclear reactor in your trunk compartment. Now, no one asked what would happen if you had a rear-end collision on Main Street and you had a nuclear meltdown. We didn't, we didn't ask these questions. And then ABC television, owned by the Disney, chan Disney people, they came out with our friend the Atom and they had a beautiful animation of the atomic airplane. The atomic airplane was a long goose-like device with a nuclear reactor generating power over here. And the pilots were sitting way over here so they, so they wouldn't mutate as the airplane soared over the stratosphere. And you can imagine an air controller strike with a hundred nuclear power plants circling San Francisco airport, waiting for permission to land. And then the creme de la creme. I finally got the blueprint for the atomic toaster one day. It was plutonium hermetically sealed due to thermionic conversion from radiation to electricity. It was guaranteed to toast your bread for 24,000 years. <laughs> Long after your toaster has disintegrated. A, a physicist came up to me and he was very sheepish. And he admitted to me that yes, he said, I was the one who designed the nuclear toaster. <laughs> well, it was thrilling to be part of this because we were so naive back in the 1950s. I was so thrilled by this that I wanted to be part of it. In fact, when I was in high school, I went up to my mother one day and I said, Mom, can I have permission to build a 2.3 million electron volt atom smasher in the garage? And my mom said, sure, I mean, why not? So I went to Westinghouse in Palo Alto. I got 300 pounds of 400 pounds of transformer steel, 22 miles of copper wire that we wound on a high school football field over Christmas, and I built a 2.3 million electron volt atom smasher in the garage. Every time I plugged it in, it consumed six kilowatts of power. It blew out every single fuse in the house. Every time the lights went out, my mom would just shake her head and say. Why couldn't I have a kid who plays baseball? I mean, maybe basketball. I mean, what's wrong with him? Well, as a consequence of this, I won the attention of a nuclear scientist who lived on Hawthorne Terrace, and he took me under his wing, and I visited his house twice a year, every Christmas, every summer. In fact, I used to fly back and forth with his daughter, Wendy, on, on the Harvard charter flight, and I was mesmerized by a scientist who helped to build the atomic bomb, who was interested in social issues. His name was Edward Teller. And Edward Teller's wife arranged for a scholarship so I would get educated to learn about these things. But then I realized that Edward Teller, my mentor, had a, had a vision. It was a very dark vision. And that vision was that nuclear war, in some sense, was inevitable. And if war is inevitable, don't you want to be prepared with the most vicious, the most ferocious nuclear weapons possible? Well, after I got my PhD, I got my PhD at Berkeley in nuclear physics. It was during the Reagan years that many of us got together, young scientists, also winners of the Hertz Engineering Scholarship. The Hertz Engineering Scholarship, according to the New York Times, was the Star Wars Scholarship. A scholarship that took the brightest high school kids in California, the brightest high school kids, winner of the science fair projects, and shot them directly into Livermore and Los Alamos National Laboratories to design third generation hydrogen warheads. Well, some of us heard scholars got together during the Reagan years, and we thought it should be possible to get a petition going. A few scientists to oppose the Star Wars program. Well, that was, as was mentioned, we were proud to announce that 8,000 nuclear scientists signed our pledge never to accept one dime for Star Wars research. We had an absolute majority of the faculty.
Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford. We had 20 Nobel Prize laureates. We had the finest scientists signing a pledge never to design these warheads. Well, it turns out that the Reagan administration was so stung by our Star Wars boycott that their, their national leader for university research was on television. And he said, yes, yes, there is this pledge. They did sign up some of these top nuclear scientists, but look, for every top nuclear scientist, there are two second-rate nuclear physicists that we can hire for the Star Wars program. And now you know why Star Wars never worked. They only have the second-rate nuclear scientists working on the Star Wars program.